Hello, hello, can you hear me? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the NAM show. I know you're at the NAM show because I am, and you're here too. That means we're at the NAM show. That made sense, right? Great. Okay, first things first, security. They've stepped it up this year. So whatever you do, don't leave the building. You may never get back in. But if you want to go to the other hall and leave us here all alone, well, take up one escalator, then another escalator, then it's a sky bridge, right? Okay, why am I telling you how to get away from my booth? I don't know. These are the openers, folks. Okay, today I have with me Cameron Webb. Maybe you've heard of Cameron Webb and his amazing collection of awesome gear. Or maybe you've heard of some of the bands he's worked with, like ooh, Motorhead, Megadeth, Pennywise. Yeah, now we're name dropping. And while I'm at it, how many Grammys do you have again? Uh, one Grammy. Oh, oh, two Grammys, two Grammys. Yeah, he has two. Engineering. For engineering, which means he's also smart. Bam, he's here at the NAMM show, and he's in our booth, McDSB, talking about, well, what he does, how he got started, and he might throw in a thing or two about a McDSP plugin. Okay, so Cameron, tell us about yourself. How did you get into audio? Let's, t let's start with this. I played music uh, in the beginning. Uh, I love music and I loved recording. So basically I started sneaking in studios to learn how to record. Uh, over the years I ended up uh, working at big facilities like uh, Larrabee Sound and uh, NRG. And NRG was home of uh, Limp Bizkit's records, Linkin Park, uh, uh, Incubus, all sorts of just bigger records in the, the late 90s. Um, so I just started working under big producers. And with those big producers, I would just watch. I would watch what gear they're using, what they're plugging in, and just learning. So I learned for about six or seven years under serious heavy hitters, people that are around here giving speeches today. And uh, one of my, I don't say first breaks, there was no really first break, but um, I met Motorhead, and I started doing records with Motorhead. And I did one record, and two, and three. I ended up doing uh, six records with Motorhead, and then all their live DVDs, and, and anything that Motorhead does. And it was, uh, uh, it was a great experience, but it was also in intense. It was a it was in it intense 12 years with Motorhead. Um, I was going to say, how did, how did you not only get that you know, pretty high-end client, how, how did you keep them? What, what was the secret there? You know what's funny? I was uh, 30 years old, and I met Motorhead, and I said, I want to do a record for you. And the manager came to me and said, well, I think you're too nice of a person. And I said, well, let me just meet with these guys and see what happens. And we got along. And they realized that I was the person that could not control them because you can't control them, but I was the leveler. And they could be free to do what they pleased, and I could kind of rein in uh, their focus. And to me, it blows me away because I grew up listening to Motorhead Records. So for me to sit in a room and sell myself, it wasn't selling myself. It was just, hey, this is what I do. I can help your records out and let's, let's work together. And luckily, after that first record, it just kept growing and growing, and they said, hey, you know what, you respect us, uh, we like what you do, so let's just keep going. And the funny thing is, over all those years, I never knew if I was gonna do another Motorhead record. So you finish a record, and you're terrified. You're like, probably never work with him again. But I was fortunate enough where we built a, a friendship and a family, and we grew over the years. Cool. Um you have a lot of really interesting outboard equipment. Do you have any favorites? Uh, you know what's funny is I, I, I'm a big fan of uh, analog front ends. I think everything that should go in analog front ends, like a good console, a good mic pre, a good compressor. And I use Pro Tools, so I, I put it all into Pro Tools. Uh, favorite one, I mean, I love my distressors. I love my, uh, um, I have a uh, retro one of the retro 176s. I love those things for getting into the computer. Um, the key to, is if I can make big sounds into the computer, once I'm in the computer, I, can, uh, I, I have more freedom where I don't have to fix things. I can just enhance things. And I mean, one reason why I'm here today is because I, the, Mic DSP, the Mic DSP plugins I use, there are certain things where I will use the compressors on lead vocals. Um, as opposed to, I used to always have like a tube compressor that I would run it through, and now McDSP is making plugins that replicate that kind of sound. And that's why uh, my first day is analog, but once I'm in the box, I'm in the box, and I need tools of EQs and compressors. And um, it, to, an example is you have an ultimate compressor that has a variety of compressors. The very first compressor that comes up is kind of a, I guess it was, it was built off a Fairchild model. 
And, and that's exactly what I would put on a lead vocal, is a Fairchild. So why not just try that? So that's what I do. I slam that thing. And what's so nice about it is you can hit that thing really hard, and it doesn't suck the life out of it. A lot of compressors, like our old school DBX 160 Xs, they're good compressors, but they, they suffocate. And, and a compressor like that is not a suffocator. It's a, it adds energy to, to what we're doing. He knows his stuff. That's pretty good. Um, any, any, any other McDSP plugins you want to name drop while we're at it? Uh, I, I, mean, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, EQs, I've always used your EQs. The newer retro EQs are great. They're simple. Um, uh, the biggest thing, I'm, I'm more into compressors than I am into the EQs, because I think a compressor is kind of like an EQ. You can you put something through it that's a little too bright, and it's going to pull that high end down, and it's going to suck the bottom end up. So to me, I go to th those banks of the Ultimate Compressor. I go to the Retro Compressor. Um, I also like the, the Limiter one, the Retro Limiter. Is that what yeah. it's called? Yep. Uh, that one's good. It's, it's very, very simple. So you're not going to get a variety of options with it. But when you take that thing and you slam it really hard and you move that gain, all of a sudden uh, it just it brings it to life. It's like an old Alltech, an old Fairchild, or old uh, uh, like LA Two A's. It, it has those sort of uh, spirits, and th those are kind of my my favorite tools that I use. Your compression that's my number one thing. And uh, I mean from the beginning, uh, the filter banks. I love the little faders with the, the old school filter banks. I've used those. I, I mean I, one of the first EQs I think I used. So. They're great. Okay. Cool. Thanks for the plug. <laughs> um, you know, when you're working with a motorhead so much, and I'm not imagine it was very like intense, like you said. How did you, you know, because you still have to like sell yourself to other clients as you go. How did you manage that kind of a time thing? You know, it's like before and after the projects, or. You know, it's funny. It, it, you, you talk about like what we do for a living. Like we do pro audio. I, I mix, I engineer, and I produce albums for a living. And I. Uh, the key is you're always, the problem is you, you have multiple jobs. You have to be a businessman. You have to be a marketing person. You have to be a good engineer, mixer, and producer because your work is where you get your next job. So if you do crappy records, no one comes back to you. So the key is like you're always doing it. You're on the way, you're on the phone on the way in. You're on the, you're on the emails on the way out and you just, you just have to hustle. And the key to all this is, is the example of Motorhead is Motorhead didn't come to me and say, Cameron, let's do a record. I went to them and said, I can make a fucking killer record for you. Let's do this. And they looked at me like, who are you? You're 30 years old. You don't know what the hell you're doing. And I said, I do. Just trust me. And we went and we made mistakes. And I remember the first day I recorded Lemmy, I plugged in his bass and I made it like a really smooth sounding bass sound. And he walks in the door and he goes, this is complete shit. What the or What are you doing? And I'm like, you know what? What do you mean, what am I doing? And he turned all the knobs on 10. The SSL we were working on overloaded, and everything was red, and everything was blown out. And he goes, that's what I'm looking for. And I was like, how do you, rec I couldn't even, I didn't know what to do. Well, I learned, I learned eventually that, hey, you know, let me pull all the, the knobs and stuff back, and let's let the amp do all the driving. And so by the second record, he walked in the door, I had his amp blaring as loud as it could go, but technically getting into the computer, getting on the tape properly. So it's, it's those things, you, 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 you work, you work and you work, and then you hustle. Uh, other groups, there's a group called Pennywise I worked with. I did uh, three records with Pennywise, just finished a brand new one. And I went to them and I said, I'm not a big fan of these six records you did, but I love these early ones. I don't like your sound. I think I can improve your sound. And I'm sticking my neck out, because a lot of times they'll, they're, they're sensitive and they'll look at you and say, you don't like our sound, why are you here? I said, because I can make your sound better. I think I can help you sonically get to a better place, whether it's a, an aggressive place or whatever it is, you just, you work and you try your best to do that. And, 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 and that's a band where I just finished their third record and, and after the first record, I didn't get the second one, I had to hustle for the second one. And the third one, I had to go and I had to knock on their door for a year. And eventually they said, okay, you know what? Let's do this. And now I'm done with it. So is there a fourth? Who knows? I'll knock on the door again, and they just got to answer or not, or choose to go somewhere else. Well, I asked him some questions. He told us some good stuff. Does anyone have some questions from the audience? You have an expert here. Two Grammys, two. two. Help us, help us. Anything? Technical? What about guitars? How do I like to record guitars? 
Uh, number one, it depends on the person. Uh, technically, uh, mic wise or mic prees or both. So for me, I'm a big uh, 57 and a 421. I, on a, like a big Marshall or a Bogner, um, I'll put those things up there. I'll put them right on the grill because I like that super direct sound. Let's say for Motorhead, Motorhead's a good example. Uh, the first record we did, it was all like Marshall uh, 900s uh, through a Marshall cabinet. And I introduced him to a Bogner on that record. And we did some leads on the Bogner. By the second record, we did all Bogner with, on, on that record for all the rhythms. Um, occasionally, we'd have like a 900. But basically, to me, is, is you take those microphones, you put them right on there. Uh, depending on what the amp sounds like, I might move it on the cone, off the cone, just depending on what I'm hearing. And then in, I, what I normally do is I take the cabinet and I put it in a separate room. I take the head and put it in the control room. So that way I know exactly what's going out of the speakers and what's going to be going on the record. And then we just turn the amp. And if it doesn't sound right, try a different cab, try a different head. Uh, I don't do any EQing on guitars. I think all the EQ do, EQing should be done within the uh, amplifiers, personally. And if you're not using the right mic and mics, that's why you do that EQing. So, if something's wrong, I'll just fix it. That's, that's kind of how I record guitars. Nothing fancy. It's actually pretty simple, what I do. Um, and it's almost the same thing with, with, uh, with Lemmy. He had a, his Marshall, so he played through a Marshall head, and then he had like a Marshall cabinet, and I would just take a 57 and put it right on there. And I would try other mics, but the 57 was, it just sounded better on all that stuff. And uh, I would often run a second amp with Lemmy, like for more bottom end. If anyone knows, he doesn't really like, or he didn't like bottom end. So sometimes I would hide that amp, but it would always give me an option later in the mix to add a little bit of meat to it. Because a Marshall on 10, basically a guitar amp, doesn't have a ton of bass, if you notice. I have a question. Yes, sir. So you coming up the ranks, start on big consoles, outboard gear, that type from start to finish, mixing, etc. What was the catalyst in your career where you started to say, you know what, as you talked about earlier, get that capture to the front end, I can let go and finish in the box. What was that? When was that and what started convincing you that I can let go, I don't have to do everything the old way, especially with the kind of acts that you were right. working with that were hardcore rock and yeah punk and whatnot. So, so the, the thing about this, uh, this question, it's very interesting, because you think about like around 2000, and at 2000, people were still using tape machines, and Pro Tools had slowly come around, and it sounded good, but it didn't sound great. It slowly started to sound great, and it started to sound acceptable where you didn't need tape anymore. What's happened now is there was a time where the plugins in the computer, they were a little harsher, they weren't quite as, there weren't the options, but slowly, Pro Tools got better, the plugins got better, and they got to the point where you would grab an 1176 and it would be broken or be scratchy. You'd, or in, in less than a second, you'd plug in, uh, let's say, a Mic DSP filter bank, and you could instantly work. And, it, and, the, and the workflow has sped up. People are they're not as patient anymore. So when they say, hey, I want to, can you brighten up the EQ? There's not time for you to go to the patch bay and do all this stuff. So I basically go in there, and I say, oh, watch this. How about this? How about this? And then bam, you have the new thing. Now, for me, it's about two or three years ago, I was always putting everything out on the console, and people wanted recalls, and recalls and recalls, but I moved on to another record, so I couldn't do recalls. So I would be losing work if I make, can't make those fixes. So I started slowly practicing and just going in the box, strictly in the box, EQs, compressors, um, not doing anything out to the console, and it, it's taken time. And there's occasionally times where I will break something out. But in general, uh, the world has changed. And, and the audio, this, these boxes we use for Pro Tools and other devices have gotten so high quality that it's just it doesn't make sense to be splitting out on these huge consoles. And, but don't get me wrong. I want to go in on a huge console with great mic prees. But the end phase, we can get great mixes. But here's the key. You just got to pay attention. You got to listen. You got to reference other records that you think are great. And you just really have to focus. And part of mixing, a big thing about mixing, it's time. Mixing doesn't just, you don't just pop out the faders and everything's great. It might take, it might take you an hour on a kick drum. It might take you two seconds. You don't know. But a lot of people that 
when I hear mixes that aren't as good, it's usually because people just rush into it and they think it's going to sound great. How's, that, how's this? I'm going to throw a Maxim on it or whatever it is. That's not the way to do it. You, you do things like you use good, like the retro compressor. I use that for vocals. I use the, um, the ultimate compressor for vocals. And they're both things that are like my old tube compressors that they just squash things and level things so I don't have to do as much EQing or uh, automation. So it's kind of a long way around where I am now in, 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 in mixing totally in the box. Yeah? Good question there. I don't know. I don't, I <laughs> so I've done a couple of Pro Mix Academies where I mix a song and people can watch it. And I did uh, a punk rock one. I just did a ska one. And I did a Motorhead one. And uh, what? <laughs> what? What's Pro Mix Academy? Does any, does, you guys know what Pro Mix Academy is? It's basically um, what, what we do is I mix a song, they video it, and I have the multi-tracks. And when we're done with that, uh, they take the video, you can watch the video, but you get to download the multi-tracks. So you can mix the song that I mixed. So with Motorhead, we did a song and it's, it's all 30 tracks. So you go there and you can do whatever you want to do it, or you can look at what I did and, and try to follow the formula. And it's funny because I was really worried about this process. I was really worried to giving people solo tracks of Lemmy or, or other artists I work for. But in the end, the people were so respectful that bought it that they weren't making fun of it, they were enjoying it, and they would ask me questions, and, and I was scared that someone was just gonna blow away this mix I did. And the funny thing is that people just did their own thing, and they were unique, and uh, it, it was actually pretty cool to see someone else's vision on, on something that, that I labored on so intensively. And an important thing is, uh, a one of the comments on one of them was I didn't have a lot of plugins on it. Um, and it's because when I went in on that chain, I used a good Neve and I used good mic pre's. So when I got in there, it was the fine tune things that we could do, like the stuff like that, that Colin makes, like those kind of things. It, it just, they make it simple and it's easy to use and it's quick. And so in general, um, that, that's what Pro Mix Academy is. It's a very cool program too. And there's other, a lot of other artists or uh, mixers have done these as well. Very cool. Thank you. Good question. Anybody else? Or we're doing okay? Should we just give away some plugins?